to the alumni, the staff, the friends, parents, relatives, well-wishers of the graduates here today, and to the 626 members of the class of 1996. You cannot imagine how grateful I am that I was invited to be here with you to celebrate this moment in your lives. You know, this is perhaps the highest moment in your life to this point, and I hope that when you take your marriage vows, if you have not yet done so, that that will be a moment of equal significance, but hardly exceeding this moment, this moment of high achievement for you. And this is your day, your day. No more all night cramming for exams. No more typing all day Sunday to finish the term paper. No more tears using up a whole using up a whole box of Kleenex for one bad midterm grade. <laughs> no more borrowing money from Aunt Clara, Uncle Bill, and everybody. <laughs> All of that mess is over with. This is your day today, and may God bless you. Now, I don't really know. Please, if you have somebody graduating, show respect. Quit hollering all over the place. Relax. We know. We know you're graduating. Just, you know, just shut up and be still and celebrate these wonderful people right here. But anyway, let me say this to you. I, I think that uh, I ought to be doubly grateful because I have no business being here as old as I am. I've been giving these commencements now for some 40 odd years, and I don't know why they keep having me, but I'm grateful. I really think they were trying to get somebody else, you know, Jesse Jackson or Colin Powell or somebody, and they were all busy, and they finally got me. But I tell you, I came anyway. Dr. Barton is one of my best friends, and I'm crazy about that lady. But let me tell you, I came because some of my best opportunities have come to me when I was substituting for somebody else. That's how I got my wife. Let me tell you what happened. <laughs> when I started college, we used to have these buses to take all the new students around to see the city of Richmond, you know. And all these pretty girls, I don't know where they found all these pretty girls to come to our college. And the senior men, I was a senior, watching to see the girls who got off the bus. And I saw one that I wanted to talk with. But I was a gentleman, I kind of laid back. And one of those great big football players jumped in front of me. He started talking to her. And I had to wait until he messed up, and I knew he would. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so... You know what he did? He handed me a note one day, told me to give this note to her. The note said, Dear Bessie, sorry I cannot take you to the movies tonight because I have to work at the John Marshall Hotel, but I will call you later on when I get off. So I read the note, you know, and I, I threw the note in the trash can. And I went on down to the dormitory and stayed around there waiting until movie time, and he didn't show up. I was all dressed up, had my fingernails clean, little oil on my hands, you know. And uh, where are you going? I said, I'm just hanging around here. Where are you going? Bob is supposed to pick me up to go to the movies, but he hadn't shown up. It's almost time. I said, don't worry about that. I'll take you to the movies. If Bob is there, we'll just see him when we get there. Well, anyway, we've been married now for 51 years. Uh, and uh, I have, uh, we have four sons and five grandchildren, and I don't know what happened to Bobby. I haven't paid any attention to that at all. I'm going to be brief because this is your commencement day. You want to get your diploma and get out of here. But I do want to say this to you. 
I want you to think about what would be an American agenda for the third millennium. Millennium. Did you hear that? Millennium. Do you know what a millennium is? That's a thousand years. And we are about now to begin the third millennium of the current era. The third millennium. You, the class of 1996, are very special people because you will be starting your careers, beginning your families, and getting settled in your new communities when the curtain rises on the 21st century and on the third millennium. That's 43 months from now. A brief 43 months. That all, that's all the time it takes to pay for a Honda or a Taurus. And then the 21st century will be here and the third millennium, a thousand years about to begin. You don't know anybody who has ever seen a millennium beginning. You don't. I don't know anybody. You're going to see it. I may see it with a whole lot of luck. It'll be close, but I hope to be here with you to see the third millennium arrive. There was no democracy in the first millennium. People were burned at the stake. The first millennium from the year one to the year 1999 was terrible. You would not want to have been around in that first millennium. They fed people to the lions for belonging to an unpopular minority. Women were treated like property. The lifespan was only 40 some odd years. There was no education for poor people like most of us. There was no middle class only the very rich, and then the serfs and the slaves and the peons on the bottom. Surgery was performed without any anesthesia, first millennium. The local barber did all the dental work. Mm. You should be glad you were not here in the first millennium. Now the second millennium is going on right now, from the year 1000 to the year 2000. Don't forget that. Our millennium. Now here's what we have seen in our millennium. We've seen modern nations begun. We saw the disorganization of the Holy Roman Empire. Universities began in Spain, in London, Timbuktu in Africa, and in Alexandria in Egypt. Arabic scholars shared the treasury of the great Greek writers of the 5th century BC. They had preserved these writings in their own Arabic language, then translated them into Latin, and the Renaissance broke loose. How grateful we are to the Arabic scholars for that. And then came the Enlightenment period, and of course the Industrial Revolution, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and all of this happened in our millennium, the second millennium. But then look at the ugly things that happened in our millennium. Don't forget this. Our millennium, colonialism, European powers ruling all of the darker-skinned people of the world in Asia, Latin America, and in Africa. 300 years of human slavery in our millennium. The Holocaust in Europe in our millennium. World War II the persistence of racism in America and in Europe. The second millennium has given us technology, democracy, freedom, and all of that, but it left us also with some awful tribalism and some ethnic polarization that we've got to work on. So all of the graduates of all of the classes of 1996 need to know that we have inherited a world that cherishes democracy, freedom and technology, but a world that needs to learn how to live together as one family of God. That's the main thing we've got to learn for this second, this third millennium that is coming aboard. You know, when I was young, I attended a church-related college where they made all of us have a liberal arts education. They didn't have money for anything else. They didn't have money to teach physics and chemistry and all of that. But they did have people around who knew the classics. So I had to take Latin, <clears throat> Latin, in order to graduate. 
I remember sitting in a Latin exam beside Simeon Booker, the editor of Jet Magazine. He and I were in school together, and I remember Simeon looking at me saying, Sam, Latin is a dead language. It died across the sea. It killed all the Romans, and now it's killing me. <laughs> But that Latin professor was so mean, and he was so tough, I decided to pass his Latin and then come back for Greek. And I popped up in his Greek class. Ah, here I am. You thought you got rid of me. And I'll never forget, he taught us a word in, Greece, in Greek that I'll never forget. Isn't it interesting how you can go all through college and just one or two things will stick with you like yesterday? Not a lot. One or two things will hang there. <laughs> and he taught us a word, polis. Please don't forget that. Forget everything that I, that I say. Don't forget. Polis. P-O-L-I-S. Polis. Now, the word polis stood for the boundary of a Greek city-state. Anything inside was part of the polis. Outside, they called the people barbarians. But if you lived in the polis, you were Greek, pure Greek. But your behavior had to be of a certain kind. You had to behave in a certain accountable sort of way. You could not do whatever you wanted to do and live in the polis. When you're in the polis, it's like signing an agreement. I'm going to live with good health and a strong mind and good character. I'm going to obey the laws that we pass. I'm going to be a reliable citizen in the polis. And guess what words we get today from that word polis? You can almost guess some of them. We get the word police. Uh -huh. We get the word polite. Uh -huh. We get the word policy, politics, cosmopolitan, metropolitan, everything that has to do with poly anything comes from polis. It means that you have to have a certain kind of a set of values at the center of the society in order for things to work out well. If you do not have a sense of polish, you have confusion, you have crime, you have racism, you have rich folks stealing all the money, Poor folk falling off the edges. You have families breaking up. No polis, chaos everywhere. And right now, we have an American polis of a sort. There are still some values that we cherish at the heart of our society. Whether you're black, Hispanic, Chicano, white, whatever, you know there are certain values at the center of the society that all of us cherish very much. In New York City, they had a little girl from Bolivia, seven years old, sneaked into the country to get surgery. She had a tumor on her spine. And one of the biggest hospitals in America with the richest, smartest medical doctor said, we will not operate on you because you need $250,000 and they turned her down. It was on television and all the newspapers and everybody heard about it and people thought it was awful because it was beyond the policy. It fell beyond our value system. We don't believe in hospitals turning down a seven-year-old girl with a spinal tumor. It was beneath our value system. And thank God, St. Jude Hospital in Memphis said, send on down here, we'll do it. And St. Vincent's Hospital in New York said, send over here, we'll do it. And I'll bet you that that hospital in New York who turned her down is still having meetings right now all weekend trying to find out who was that dumb doctor that made such an announcement of that. Now you know he was dumb because who told him that it would cost a little girl $250,000 for him to remove a tumor from her spine? After all, he had a brain with which to perform the operation that he got free, didn't he? He can't make a brain, can he? Huh? Now listen, 
he was going to use hands. He can describe a hand. He can operate on a hand. But my soul, he can make a hand. And he's got two hands free to operate on that girl. Not only that, centers of medical education lying there waiting for him that he didn't create. Who told him the bill ought to be $250,000? How arrogant of him to say a thing like that. So we can always tell when somebody steps beyond the boundary of politeness and decency and respect for human worth. Right now, the polis is in deep trouble. And I'll tell you where our trouble lies. First of all, we can't agree on what government ought to do. Some folk don't like government at all. You know that? They're going around here blowing up post offices, blowing up the World Trade Center, you know, piling up guns in some ignorant place out here in the mountains somewhere. They don't want any government at all. Some other people think they're smart and political. All they want the government to do is to control registration of automobiles, vaccination for diseases, pure water, control divorces, and stop right there. Don't need any more government at all. That's a dangerous attitude for people to have. This is the most wonderful country in the world. Big mistakes, we've got flaws, I know that. But I'm not turning in my passport for anybody. I'm hanging tight right here. I want to see what the end is going to be. If America is not what it ought to be, I want to spend the rest of my time trying to make it what it ought to be. My great-grandparents labored here. Their blood and sweat helped to make this country great. I'm not walking out on it now. I want to be here to have all the goodies that belong to me. And I want the government to be responsive. Here's, some, here's the way some people think, you know. They said, we don't want to be spending the taxpayers. I don't know who they're calling taxpayers. I'm a taxpayer. Who are they talking about? Taxpayers. That's all of us, isn't it? We voted to send them there where they are. Taxpayers like they're talking about elves who came from Mars or somewhere. We're all taxpayers. When I was a youngster, they gave me $15 a month on an NYA contract. NYA, you know, National Youth Administration. That's all the room and board was at that time, $15 a month. In four years, they spent $600 on me. Four years, $600. And I'm not rich. I never made a lot of money. But for the last 10 years, I've been paying them more in income taxes every week than they spent on me for four years. Did you hear what I said? And you're going to do the same thing when you get out of here. Can you multiply? Isn't that a wonderful investment? We'll take that little Sam Proctor, and we're going to spend $600 on him, and he's going to give it back to us every week of his life, as long as he lives. That's good mathematics, isn't it? Isn't that a good investment? Don't you know it's better to spend money on young people, educate them, than to leave them growing up like weeds and then spend all the money on them in jail. And another thing, I hear these geniuses talking about the national debt. I know we've got a debt, $13 trillion. I also know it's 260 million of us around here to pay it. Now, let me tell you something. We don't have to have a debt. If we had let Hitler run over the whole world, make slaves out of everybody. If we had let Russia communize every corner of the world, we would right now be sleeping with MiG fighters covering the night sky every night. All black folk would have stamps on the back of their hands in order to go to the beach to put out the garbage to collect the newspaper, huh? Saddam Hussein would have all the gasoline choked up. You'd be paying $10 a gallon and stand in line and get a mayonnaise jar full of gas, huh? You don't have to have a national debt. You could have had those conditions to prevail right now, and you wouldn't have had a national debt. But I don't want to live like that. Your generation does not want to live like that. We paid a debt, we owe a debt, and we know what we owe it for. We have freedom. We have self-determination. 
we have a world at peace. We wake up in the morning, we don't have to worry about somebody snatching us out of the bed and hauling us off to jail. We have freedom and all of that we have to pass on to the next generation. I could balance my budget at home if I wanted to. If we all quit eating, we'd have a balanced budget. But we have priorities we have to observe. So that's what we've got to straighten out right now. We've got to tell everybody representing us, we want a certain quality of life in this country. The primary goal is not what you think it is. The primary goal is to have a certain quality of life for all of our citizens. Focus on that and we'll scuffle and pay the bill. But we want a quality of life for everybody. A. B. We've got another problem with our, with our uh, so-called polish right now. We cannot agree on how to treat people who have a late start in life. Not everybody was born with the same advantages. You know that. I'm standing here talking to you, but I bring to this moment in my life a very, very huge amount of great good fortune. Born black, born poor, born in the Great Depression and raised in all of that segregation. But I had a grandmother who was sent to Hampton right out of slavery. The family that owned my grandmother sent her to Hampton right after slavery. And my grandmother was in our home all of my young years. She taught me how to pronounce words, taught me how to speak without making grammatical errors, taught me how to spell, taught me how to be polite, how to say yes ma'am and no ma'am and please and thank you. My grandma made my life what it was. Came right out of slavery, little skinny woman with a lot of power and grace. My grandma made me go to Sunday school every Sunday morning. You had to prove to that woman that you were sick and couldn't go. And the only way you could prove it to her was you'd be willing to drink one of those little 15 cent bottles of pure castor oil. And grandma, grandma would let you have that castor oil any way you wanted it. You could have it straight up on the rocks. You could have it with orange juice, have it with lemon juice, chop up onions in it, put honey in it sugar, anything you wanted, but that castor oil had an integrity of its own and it was bound to fulfill its high destiny. You either served God all day or you didn't have any plans all day on Sunday and Monday was in great doubt as well. I'm here today standing in front of you because I had a grandma that I couldn't buy with a visa card. I couldn't order her up from Sears Roebuck. God gave me a grandma, and that's why I'm here. And my brothers, all of them had the same grandma. One went into dentistry, one went into medicine, one became an officer in the Air Force. All of us did what we wanted to do because of a grandma that God gave us that we did not deserve. And don't you know one thing? All of you who have benefits in your life that you did not deserve, you owe it to go out of here and help somebody who has deficits, deficits that they did not deserve. They did not deserve. Don't go out here laughing at people who are uneducated. Don't go laughing at people who are poor. Don't laugh at folk who've sunk into drug and alcoholism. Help somebody. Lift them up because somebody lifted you up. And finally, finally, we've got to straighten the policy out about what the government ought to do, straighten it out about how we ought to help folk who have less and fewer advantages than we have, and we've got to learn how to live together no matter what our color or religion may be. This is what America has to offer to the world. Now I know, I know how angry you and I can get because of racism and discrimination. I know that. You don't have to recite to me how much racism there is. I know all of the whereas is, whereas this, whereas that, whereas that, whereas that. But I've got to hurry up and get to the therefore. You know, you can't hang around whereas all the time. You've got to move on to therefore. 
That's where I am right now, at the therefore. You don't need to be a genius, a rocket scientist to know what's wrong, but you got to make a resolution on what you plan to do about it. And you plan right here to go out of here, take your degree, your character, your hope, your faith, and make a strong life for yourself. Do things right, do things right, and then contribute to the success and the beauty of this nation of ours so that when the third millennium starts, you'll be part of the great sponsorship of a wonderful human community. And every now and then I see something that tells me that things really are going to change. I went down to a small college in South Carolina, in Clinton, South Carolina, to give a commencement address. And while I was down there, I saw a brand new building on the campus, a beautiful new student union. It's a small little Presbyterian college. And I said to the president, that's a handsome building. He said, Sam, that's a state-of-the-art student union, $20 million. Everything is in there, big computer center and everything. And I said, I see the name on it, Martha Dendy Hall. Who was Martha Dendy? Oh, you don't know her, do you? No, I don't. You know who Martha Dendy was? She was a woman who had died 20 years earlier, but who for 30-some years had been the laundry lady for the male white fellas in that school. It was a white male college. And this black woman who lived over in what they called the colored section would do their laundry. Every day, all day long, you would see this straight, tall black woman walking across the campus of Presbyterian College back in the 1950s and 40s, way back in that time. She would have a basket filled with clean, starched clothes going to the dormitory, then pick up another basket full of dirty clothes going back. And while she was walking, clothes were blowing in the wind on her clothesline in the backyard. No drying machine, no automatic washing machine. Her body was just like steel with a washboard and just rubbing and scrubbing. All had six children of her own. They couldn't even go to that college. They had to go to Claflin and South Carolina State. Have mercy, Father. And all the little boys called her Aunt Martha. She would pray with them when they were doing wrong. When she heard they had death in the family, put her arms around them and said the 23rd Psalm in the air. She was Aunt Martha to all of them, and then she died. They named the little street after her in Clinton, Martha Dendy Street. Named the little elementary school after her, Martha Dendy School. And then when the trustees met, all these old white politicians and judges, you know, and rich textile men sitting around the table, we want to appoint a committee now to name the new student union here about three years ago. She's been dead a long time, dead and forgotten, they thought. But there's a God somewhere, you know it? And don't you know, when they got ready to name that committee, somebody said, Sir, I rise to recommend. We don't need a committee to name this building. My mind goes back to a woman who served all of us sitting around this table while we were in college. Old Aunt Martha, Martha Dandy, I move you, sir, that we put her name on this $20 million student union so that all the students on into the long future will know that we cared a lot about Martha Dandy and we don't want to forget her for all of these years. And before anybody could say anything, another one stood up, tears rolling down his face. He said, I'm honored to rise in second emotion. In Clinton, South Carolina, about three years ago, white politicians, textile magnets, bankers, with no gun held to them, no law requiring it, just the slow breathing of God's Holy Spirit. They stood up, named that building after that woman, got up and tipped on out of the room. So when I came there a long time later, Whose name is that, Sam? That's the name of the black laundry lady who served these trustees, and they wanted her name there. You know why I don't give up and why my heart is filled with hope? Because a little thing like that stays in my mind, and I know that we can get this polish straightened out. May God bless you all.